Good afternoon. I'm Raleigh Flynn, the president of the Foreign Policy Research Institute, and we're delighted to have you here this afternoon for the second installment of a four-part seminar series that's addressing the concept of a Meta West. Uh, today, we're going to be looking at the Meta West as a geopolitical system, and we have Ambassador Robert Hunter and Dr. Tiziana Stella, who are joining us today. Um, our host today and moderator is Ron Granieri, who is the FBRI Templeton Education Fellow and the Executive Director of FBRI's Center for the Study of America and the West, as well as the host of our People, Politics, and Prose monthly series of events. He's also an Associate Professor of History in the Department of National Security and Strategy at the U.S. Army War College, which is why I have an oblig obligatory disclaimer that anything he says here today uh, constitutes his personal views and and it's not representative of the U.S. government, the U.S. Army, or the, um, or the Army War College. Um, before I turn it over to Ron, I would also like to say thank you to our supporters and, um, and members. Uh, we cannot do what we do without you, and we are very, very grateful. Um, if you're not yet in one of those categories, please consider becoming a donor and a member. Um, without further ado, I shall turn it over to Ron Granieri. Take it away, Ron. Thank you, Raleigh. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this special briefing, The Meta West as a Geopolitical System. The latest seminar is part of the FPRI's Robert Strauss Who Pay Project, The Atlantic System in a World of Great Power Rivalry. Today, we want to talk about the role of the network of organizations that link the democratic states of the Atlantic system to global allies and partners. A guiding idea of this conversation, indeed of all of our conversations in this series, is the understanding that the meta West exists as a thing in itself, even if the leaders and populations within it do not always clearly articulate their understanding of it. Uh, adversaries certainly recognize the connections, say, between NATO and ANZUS, or AUKUS for that matter, um, but whether the people who are participating in running and organizing these events or these organizations really do appreciate that is one of the things we want to explore in these discussions. Would it better serve the interests of the free states of the West and its global partners that make up this meta West if they were to think and speak more clearly about those connections? How does the meta West operate as a geopolitical system? Do the constituent parts fit together? What, if anything, can the leaders within this network of relationships do to make the system work more efficiently? These questions and yours will guide us in conversation with our guests today, Ambassador Robert Hunter and Dr. Tiziana Stella. Ambassador Robert Hunter is a principal with the Ambassador Partnership in London. From 1993 to 1998, he was U.S. Ambassador to NATO and represented the U.S. to the Western European Union. Before that, he managed European relations at the National Security Council in the Carter administration. He was the principal architect and U.S. negotiator of the new NATO, including the Partnership for Peace and NATO-EU relations, and he negotiated the airstrike decisions that ended the Bosnia War. Dr. Tiziana Stella is a historian of U.S. foreign policy, international organization, and federalism. Since 2004, she has been the executive director of the Strite Council, where she manages programs and research. She's currently working on an intellectual biography of Clarence Streit that focuses on the impact of federalist thinking on U.S. foreign policy planning in the 20th century. Welcome, Dr. Stella, Ambassador Hunter. Yeah. To get started, I wanted to give each of the guests a chance to offer some of their general thoughts about the concept of the Meta West and the, these, uh, this network of organizations. I wanted to ask Dr. Stella if she would start us off. Please, Dr. Sure, Stella. Ron, thank you. This is a wonderful introduction to a very important theme. I thank the organizers for putting together this seminar. Uh, that focuses on the um, Atlantic system, which is very important for world order. Uh, my remarks would be on the history of this system. So before its institu institutionalized phase uh, and uh, looking at what were the main ideas that brought together these institutions later on in the afterward. 
So there were three main ideas behind the creation of this system. And these three main ideas were reinforced during the interwar, but they are much longer roots and they go back to the 1800. The basic premises behind construction of this Atlantic system in the post-war was that democracy cannot, was not compatible with an international environment of anarchy, interdependence, and increasing violent capabilities. So they created these structures to replace uh, the multipolar uh, balance of power with uh, instead a unipolar imbalance of power externally and internally with a sharing of power and democracy. The third idea that uh, was uh, uh, um, behind this organization was that democracies did have a superiority of power, but their power was not organized. And therefore they were the main cause of global instability. If they were organized, they could have been at the center of the global system and being uh, providing the global system stability and order. So um, the very beginning of uh, these ideas, we have to go back to the 1800 and uh, specifically at the beginning when the Atlantic diplomatic system started. And uh, at that moment, uh, the um, geopolitical ideas of Atlanticism are the first steps in the context of the reconfiguration of uh, um, diplomacy with the Anglo-American rapprochement. And then, and, that, and this was in the context of uh, uh, Mahan theories on the importance of sea power and power to protect democracy. So here, the idea of preponderance of power on the side of democracy. The first time that we see um, mentioned the uh, expression Atlantic system is with Henry Adams. And uh, he conceptualized it as um, an Atlantic combine that would be ever growing would bring unification um, to the global order and stability by bringing in new members, former enemies, and so eliminating causes of war. Uh, in terms of the other idea, the second idea, the sharing of power and uh, democracy, that came um, emerged a little bit earlier in the context of the success of the uh, union with the civil war and the writing of John Fisk, they were very popular. Those two elements gave a, brought attention to the fact that actually federalist frameworks could be useful to be applied also on the international uh, level to overcome power politics. And through federalism, it was possible to move from anarchy to peace. It was also uh, possible to create a strong cohesive union and, uh, and by sh in sharing of internal power and democracy. It was also possible to extend uh, um, gradually the area of freedom, peace, and the rule of law. The third idea, the idea that the democracies should and could play a leading role in the world order and could provide stability to the global order was more an outcome of World War I, where the idea was very widespread, even if uh, we don't talk much about it in historiography, but it was shared by Wilson, it was within his administration, it was shared by uh, Lippmann that thought about the Atlantic community as the beginning of uh, Union of Democracy and the first act World War Federation, he said enthusiastically in 1917. And Norman Angel, there was an advisor to, um, working together with uh, Lippmann, an advisor to uh, Wilson, uh, proposed a defensive alliance of the democracies to continue the wartime alliance and not to dismantle the inter-allied boards. Uh, this idea was also very important to Jean Monnet that then became important in the uh, post-war. And at the same time, um, the, the two biggest movement for pub public movement uh, for the Organization of Peace, the League to Enforce Peace and the League of Free Nation Association uh, at the end of the war, they subscribed to the same victory program that stated that the uh, membership in the uh, league should be prioritized for the democracies and that the league should not be run by unanimity. On the diplomatic side, there was, there is, there was then the Treaty of uh, Guarantee to France uh, by the United States and Britain that did not work, but then the idea was realized with NATO after another world war. The further uh, step in the development of these ideas is the interwar. 
And that is a very important moment because we do have a, a, a global organization to provide collective security, but uh, unable to prevent uh, the global economic and security crisis. Uh, widespread ideas of a crisis of democracy, that democracies are weak, they cannot compete with autocracies. And it is in this framework and looking at this reality that Clarence Streit, that was uh, at the time a New York Times journalist at the League and he was able to observe day by day, uh, they working on the leagues, uh, realized like other intellectuals that the main problem was uh, the fact that the anarchy among the democracies, they were the main cause of global instability. And they came with a formulation that the democracies by uniting could in one moment stop uh, global instability. This uh, was also um, an idea that was important because as the, as the autocracies were able to mobilize, even uh, in peacetime, uh, democracies were not able to be mobilized their power unless organized after facto when the wars already started. So the idea of actually bringing together democracies in peacetime became really critical in this moment. And also uh, this brought the attention to another aspect that the consolidation of the unity of democracies was more important as a priority to create an environment that would be favorable to democracy than other priorities on the table. Streit then summarized his ideas and brought his ideas out with a book that he wrote while he was in Geneva, but could not get published. And uh, the idea was to prevent the war by bringing the democracies together, but war broke off, the book was published and it had a big impact. The impact was not only due because of the novelty of the model that he proposed, but because it was uh, presenting uh, the ideas of this generation that had gone through World War I and then through the interwar. And uh, so these were shared ideas. Um, and also because it sort of summarized uh, in a new synthesis, the three main ideas of imbalance of power externally, uh, sharing of power internally, and the democracy as the core of world order. Um, at the same time, you also uh, brought together the lesson of the interwar now, um, what Stride uh, proposed uh, was what Stride proposed was um, look what he called a nucleus uh, union uh, of democracies of the Atlantic democracies, and he conceptualized this union uh, in a way that would bring uh, uh, would give democracy the most effectiveness in the world order. So in this formal model that you propose as a strategy to, um, as a strategy, uh, the characteristics that, uh, the characteristics of this model were that it had to be small enough so that uh, it, countries could unite uh, right away, but it also had to be homogeneous enough so there could be a community of purpose. These are, um, homogeneity and the fact that it was more allowed this nucleus to be uh, deeply integrated, it proposed maximum integration, uh, federal integration. And that uh, this would allow bringing in new members uh, at a much faster rate than if it had not been so deeply united. And that was a very important aspect in his thinking because uh, while uh, uh, the idea of preponderance of power was part of this conceptualization, it was a uh, proposing a different setting, it was not power as in the setting of hegemony, but uh, it was the idea of bringing new members and making them part of the decision-making procedures and sharing of power was a qualitative, qualitatively different idea of uh, preponderance of power. Uh, the other idea that uh, was critical for this nucleus uh, to provide maximum effectiveness uh, to democracy was uh, that it had to be strong enough, it had to have enough critical mass to uh, alter not just the relations among its members, but also the dynamic of world power. Uh, and that for strike was very important. And uh, he formulated that when he said that this would be the first time in history that a democracy, it was a union of democracies, would be uh, the main power 
in the global order. And the dynamics of this democracy that he had envisioned would allow uh, the, uh, transform progressively uh, also the dynamics of the global order. The book uh, had also a great impact on the people that then became uh, the architects of uh, the Atlantic system in the post-war. So we uh, will click that did not develop as one organization, but as multiple organizations. And the um, economic side was more on the European side and uh, it was propelled by the Marshall Plan, which then gave uh, birth to the OEC and then the OECD. And the main uh, drafter and the main architect of the Marshall Plan, Will Clayton, had been deeply influenced by uh, Stride. Of course, the plan, uh, the frameworks that were implemented in the after in the post war were not the same as those of Stride, but they uh, were modeled after the ideas that were proposed at that time because they were conveying the experience of all the previous generations that there was some consensus on that. Uh, and the, the security was provided by NATO. And uh, uh, the idea of the nucleus that Stride, uh, that was central to Stride plan uh, was incorporated in these structures, uh, but not as uh, one nucleus, but as double nucleus. In this, we see the influence of Jean Monnet that spoke of moving ahead with the countries that were ready to go ahead on certain tasks. And so we have a nucleus of countries and a nucleus of nations. And that later created the widening deepening problem of these structures. The same is visible in NATO, where Article 2, it was initially a bridge I had to move the alliance from alliance to community. And then there were also talk about moving this community to federation eventually. So this was the logic uh, that was incorporated in uh, the uh, first uh, post-war structures of, Atlantic, of the Atlantic system and then were replicated as the Atlantic system extended to the Pacific area. And uh, if I, uh, my concluding remark would be that because these structures have not been created as one body, but as many organizations, there is emerged a problem of coordination within these structures. And this problem of coordination is important because while the democracies still hold uh, superiority and balance of power, by not coordinating their power, if history can be a lesson to anything, uh, they leave the door open to a lot of challenges. And uh, so it seems to me that perhaps the, if the Atlantic system or the extended Atlantic system, the Meta West wants to remain relevant in the future, focus should be given to coordinating better the, uh, these different organizations and, uh, and uh, bringing them to a closer and stronger and denser unity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stella, for those opening remarks. And, and uh, Ambassador Hunter, that allows me that allows me to toss it to you in your experience as Ambassador to NATO, but also in working on issues like NATO EU relations, to think about how do these, uh, in your experience, how these organizations have or have not succeeded in creating a, a a sense of integrated or coordinated action, even within the transatlantic space, let alone with the in the broader global arena. So please, some opening remarks from you. Well, thank you, Ron, and thank you to uh, Tiziana for a really superb uh, background introduction and of uh, creating a framework for where we are today. I, I should say that I'm delighted that this is a Robert strauss Huppé forum. Uh, I don't know whether anybody else uh, on this program knew him. Uh, I knew him and he was a friend. Uh, he was an extraordinary individual a man of great charm, a man of great uh, uh, courtesy towards others. And I recall one day uh, in 1978, I think it was 79, when we were having the hostage crisis with, with Iran. And on that particular day, I happened to be uh, the acting national security advisor and Robert strasser Pay came for a visit. And he said, Bob, he said, there is one book you must read if you want to understand what is going on with Iran? And in great anticipation, because we were all confused, I said, what's that? He said, Kim by Rudyard Kipling. Mm -hmm. so, I, so I read it and he was right, which is a basic thing, which is you got to learn about cultures. You got to learn history 
And one of the things that we don't do well now, and fortunately at your institution in, in Philadelphia you do, is about history. And one of the problems we're having right today, now let me just give one quick example. The thing that has just happened with the French being out of sorts uh, over being left out of the, uh, the agreement between the United States, uh, uh, Britain and Australia, the terribly named thing called AUKUS, you could call it awkward, is that the French remember that's very similar to what happened with the Nassau Agreement in uh, 1962. I happen to be part of the US Navy team that introduced Polaris, which came out of that uh, in the British Admiralty. But the French not only, De Gaulle was not only felt a sense of being betrayed as part of the Atlantic world and also betrayed by the British, but then he used it three weeks later to veto Britain's admission to uh, the European Union and later on to withdraw uh, French uh, uh, forces from, from NATO and to leave Allied Command uh, 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 Europe, something that I worked very hard on uh, to restart going the, the other way. Uh, but the French remember that, and uh, we don't. And uh, the British, of course, never took the European Union seriously, which is one of the problems of the West today, and the Mato West, if you want to call it that. All right, now, let, let me just jump to... Uh, a couple of three things that happened. I'm going to talk, start with the European framework. Uh, after the Second World War, when there was the threat from the Soviet Union and from, I'm going to call it European communism, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, there were kind of three approaches to it with different institutions. And Tiziana has given us some introduction. They had three elements. Uh, number one was, in no particular order, economic political, security, and defense. The Marshall Plan, uh, NATO, Allied Command uh, Europe, uh, the uh, United States political and strategic commitments through the North Atlantic Treaty. Uh, people sometimes forget that the United States only has, despite the, the word alliance is used so loosely, we only have actually 34 alliance commitments in the world by treaty ratified by the Senate of the United States, in which we are obligated at least to consider going to war if any of these countries are attacked. And in fact, in NATO, the only time so-called Article 5 of the treaty was invoked was on 9-12. And it wasn't invoked by us, it was invoked by the other allies to help the United States. It wasn't designed for that, it was designed for us to help Europeans, but, the, but it had that, that impact. Well, the Cold War comes to an end and as we were trying to figure out what do you do about the future, where the main concern was the European theater. Uh, you had the collapse, not only of the Soviet Union, but of the entire Soviet uh, and communist East European uh, empire. In fact, there has never in human history been such a collapse of empires in all of peacetime history, nothing like that. And so what was put together on a bipartisan basis great thing about NATO, it's always been bipartisan, was to use those three same elements, the economic, the political, uh, the uh, security, and the defense. And that included, as you've already just said, uh, uh, the European Union, where the United States still has inadequate relations with the EU, uh, which we had better. And uh, NATO, unfortunately, has inadequate relations with uh, the EU as well. And if we're going to have a true meta West, even in the European framework, we've got to get that better. We've got to get that better. But those, those were the, the elements. And so it was a matter of trying to move beyond uh, the old balance of power, uh, the old idea of spheres of influence in Europe. And it had a number of elements. I'll just run through it very quickly. Keep the United States as a European power, number one. Keep the German problem solved. That's why Germany was brought into NATO as a whole. And the Russians accepted that so that we Americans could watch over Germany. Uh, and they surrounded Germany with NATO and the European Union. Uh, so the next generation of Germans couldn't do what the previous two generations did, even if they wanted to. Uh, to take Central Europe off the geopolitical chessboard, where they had been approximate causes of uh, all three wars of the 20th century, two hot and one cold, uh, to bring, try to bring Russia into some kind of organization of European society. That failed. And today we're facing the consequences. 
Now, that was essentially what we were doing in the West through most of the period of following the Cold War. Of course, there were other aspects. There was uh, uh, the Middle East, which we're still struggling to get right. Uh, and uh, we had 9-11, uh, uh, and later on, the Europeans went with us as NATO into Afghanistan. Some went with us uh, into uh, the aftermath of Iraq, which was probably the worst decision that we've taken in, in the post-Cold War era, if not uh, even before. But you've got to understand, the reason the Allies went with us to Afghanistan was not because they were worried terrorism is going to come from there to their countries. There was, oh, there was some. It was to make sure the United States wouldn't forget about Europe because the United States is the only country that can deal effectively with Russia. Now, if you move to the Pacific, it was essentially during the Cold War what I call a holding action. Uh, we had to worry about what Stalin did uh, with regard to uh, Korea. And then uh, because of some mis miscalculation on everybody's side, we and the Chinese got into war there. And then eventually uh, we created a security agreement with South Korea, which still holds, and we got troops there. Uh, later on, uh, we got involved in, uh, in Vietnam because we saw it not, who cared about Vietnam as a place, all right? And we cared about it because of the role of the Soviet Union and then the role of the Chinese. Uh, and in fact, because of the strength of the U.S. relationship in the Cold War with our traditional allies, we could lose a war and it didn't matter. It didn't matter. And in fact, uh, Vietnam is now closer to us than it is to Russia and to China. Well, we, we ignore the fact that there had been 2,000 years of enmity between China and Vietnam. We didn't learn enough from history. Okay, now with the rise of China, we are shifting focus, we the United States, very much to uh, the Pacific. People forget sometimes that there are only two NATO countries that are also Pacific countries, the United States and Canada, Although the French would say, oh, we got some islands out there. You got to pay attention to us, us too. But that's just kind of sour grapes over what's happening with Britain and, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and Australia. And so what the United States is trying to do is what, what's called a pivot uh, was an unfortunate term that came up under the Obama administration. And the president had to say, oh, I'm a basketball player. Pivot is when you put a foot down and then you do something else. Uh, it was because of the... Uh, the shift to Asia. Well, it only works, whether it's Meta West or whatever it is, if there is a solid transatlantic relationship, which is our number one trading partners. It's our number one security place. It's our number one repository of a collective of democracies. Uh, and in fact, uh, Obama, I think, had a very good phrase for it, which uh, should be followed by every president. He said, Anything, anything we want to do anywhere in the world, we're better off if we do it with North Atlantic allies and partners. It's a, most of the countries we deal with on friendly relations are actually partners, not formal allies. So now as we shift towards Asia, we're having to find ways, not just of dealing with it on our own in regard to figuring out how to handle China, but how to bring other countries along with us. And yes, we all have a common commitment to the international order, uh, to the Western system of doing things economically and politically. And we also have common security interests up to a point, but quite frankly, and that gives us a kind of a meta West if you want. A lot of the European allies don't share our perspective on China. They just don't. They have economic relations with them and and God forbid that they are asked to go and fight out there. Now I'm going to say just a word about AUKUS and I'll show up, shut up. Uh, this was essentially a political thing. Uh, the uh, Prime Minister of Australia had a problem. They become too close to China for their own comfort economically. And he was feeling the heat. So he went into this thing with the United States and, and this thing with regard to the submarines and you know, I think the French have a, uh, have a gripe. They wanted to sell Australia nuclear submarines. Uh, the, the Australians said, oh, that's too expensive, that's too diesel. Then they decided that wasn't right. And now they're doing nuclears with us. 
But let's face it, those nuclear submarines aren't going to be available for about two decades. I mean, the Chinese are all upset, and that's what they say, but it's really more symbolic than anything else. Now, the same with the Quad. Uh, let me think if I can get them right. Uh, the Japanese, uh, the United States, the Australians, and the Indians. Right now, it's just a symbolic thing. If you look at the meeting that was held last week, there's nothing about security in there. But it is a way of saying we're beginning to, to uh, uh, think in that way. Uh, for the British, it was a political drama. Here was the British Conservative Party doing its utter stupidity of call, I'm sorry, I'm leading witness, called Brexit by leading, leaving uh, Europe and thereby taking themselves out of really the effective balance against Russia. Yes, NATO, but not the European institutions. And also are no longer a balancer between uh, Germany and France, which was one of their big deals. So here is Boris Johnson saying, I want to be global Britain, and I've got a couple of aircraft carriers. What do I do with them? Um, they're useless virtually, so I'll put one of them in the Pacific, but they're useless there unless they have a lot, bunch of American ships along with them. Quite frankly, we don't need them. And here is poor United States got caught in the middle, uh, becoming Uncle Sucker in some ways. And poor Mr. Biden didn't have people around him to say, here's what's really going on. And so he, uh, he ended up with, with a problem which was to try to solve the problems for Britain and for, for Australia. So that's where we are. So it is true that we are going to have to work together in the so-called Middle West. And Iris Strauss is with you and we remember Jim Huntley, who was a great proponent of this, but we're gonna to have to think a lot more thoroughly about what it means, what it does and what it doesn't do. But starting off with the very strong transatlantic bonds without which nothing. Thank you, Ambassador Hunter. That makes, uh, that makes a lot of sense. I like how you, you tied it up nicely in a bow, right? That after all, if we're serious about pivoting, right, you can't, uh, you got to plant your foot someplace firmly. Um, you can't right. plant your foot on, uh, in, it's, hard, it's hard to pivot on sand. It's easier to pivot on something firm, like a firm transatlantic relationship. Well, this is good. We have, we have uh, about a half an hour for question and answer. And I have questions. And also I encourage the audience to send questions in using the Q&A feature on Zoom. Um, I already see one here from Dustin Harris, which actually gets right to something that both of you brought up. And uh, uh, even though originally it was, it was pointed at you, uh, uh, Tiziana, the, um, and this is, Dustin asks, uh, does the does the Meta West or the Atlantic system continue to be guided by the same ideas that you that you traced uh, in its historical development? Um, and how have how have those ideas been challenged? Because I'm I'm curious about you know if if we when we talk about the relationship of practical politics to ideas, right? You have to know how you want the world to work before you can decide how to make the world work that way. And so what role do these broad ideas that you sketched in the origins, what role do you see them playing today? And then I want to come back to you, Ambassador Hunter, um, about this as well. But please, first, uh, uh, Tiziana, Dr. Stella. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, well, there definitely there are uh, divergences that come across through time, but I think that the same ideas that um, were at the beginning um, held throughout um, the system that um, uh, was created. One thought um, that um, I, I wanted to share was a problem in the perception of these ideas is also the mm, discourse that has been started now on the great power competition and uh, balancing, multipolar balancing. And uh, <clears throat> While the West and while these institutions are still, in my opinion, strongly uh, supporting the same set of ideas, the same strategy, uh, the same uh, values, um, this discussion has been a distraction. And so um, reinforcing the fact that these ideas can still play an important role for global stability, for peace, but above all for democracy. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is something that is shared on a wider scale than not just the Meta West. Uh, the idea of democracy is an idea that the discussion about global democracy, the uh, discussion about uh, how we can transform even the UN system within uh, the context of democracy. But the discussion on democracy really centers on the ability 
to have democracy work and to have democracy matter in the world. And if democracy doesn't matter, then uh, the whole discussion on democracy doesn't really uh, go anywhere. So um, I think that one aspect that, that usually has not been stressed enough is how critical these structures are to maintain an international uh, climate where democracy can flourish. And it is more important to keep the depth and to, of these structures and to focus on the cohesion of these structures rather than trying to enlarge them and distract on other issues. Um, so, yeah. That's that's very good. Th thank you. Thank you, Tiziana. And well, to you, Ambassador Hunter, this uh, uh, two things I wanted to mention, I, I forgot to, as you said, one is that uh, we at FPRI, of course, we were quite devoted to our founder, Robert Strauss-Upay. We recently acquired his his library, which we're hoping to uh, to be able to display uh, a man of immense culture and immense learning and uh, and and everybody. And fun. And and that's what I hear that, too, the yeah, as as much of a bon vivant as an Austrian uh uh, an Austro-Hungarian, uh, you know, I don't know if he was directly a nobleman, but he's apparently, he sure did, he sure did play, play one well. never better manners. <laughs> so that, that is, I also noticed that you have your NATO flag literally proudly flying behind you, which I think is a very important part of this discussion. But this idea about ideas and about, you know, what does it mean? I mean, uh, Dr. Stella really brings up this point about that the, the transatlantic, ideas of the transatlantic cooperation were ideas built around cooperation among democracies um, and to try to figure out how you know democracies uh, how they how they create can create and maintain an alliance system um, while recognizing that as democracies they may have internal disagreements about policy. I know it's one of the questions Michael Multu asks, why don't Russia and China um, form an alliance themselves? And, and I will say one of the paradoxes of modern, perhaps not a paradox, one of the uh, uh, things that we can say about the modern world is that China has clients, but China does not have partners and allies like the United States does. Uh, and it's got nothing to do with power, but it does have something to do with how you manage disagreement. Um, and perhaps democracies that manage internal disagreement also are able to manage disagreements among them. You mentioned Polaris, you mentioned the complicated relationship between the United States and France. But how do ideas of what this cooperation is supposed to mean, um, how do they shape policy decisions when you're when you're talking about how NATO operates, how discussions happen within NATO or between organizations? Where, what, world, what role do ideas play in all that? Well, first, let me say, if there is a Russia-Chinese alliance, I wish the Russians good luck, but the Chinese, <laughs> will, eat, the Chinese will eat them for breakfast. That's I'm going I'm I'm to write, write that down and we'll bring that's it back the, and talk about that more. Yeah. All right, ideas. Um, we're also talking about power. Mm. And despite all the talk that goes on now about uh, authoritarian countries are more efficient, that's mm -hmm. one of the arguments and one of the fears in the West that democracy is going to fade and all that. Uh, I worry in this country right now, there are far too many people looking at uh, the last two elections and looking forward to the next election and where we are from January 6th and all that kind of stuff who don't take democracy seriously enough mm. and don't take the amazing resiliency of our society. And people say this is the worst crisis we've had since the uh, uh, Civil War. No, the worst crisis was the Great Depression, where we didn't go communist and we didn't go fascist. Come on, these are much, much deeper things than that. Okay, it is, I believe, much better for countries to deal with one another if they're operating with similar kinds of ideas that are also based on power, which is open trading systems, uh, power which is moderated by understanding there are certain values in commonality and not just looking for one's own self-interest, but understanding there's more self-interest to be gained by working together. That's been developing, as Tiziana would say, uh, Woodrow Wilson started some of this in the uh, he was premature and a lot of a lot of other things, but there was a germ of something in there to try to move beyond uh, uh, beyond uh, uh, the old 19th century balance of power system, which incidentally came up in 1815 and it worked for 99 years. And then when it collapsed, it was a doozy in That's 1914, true. but it basically worked for 99 years. 
uh, and also to have societies in which people are able to express themselves. Uh, democracy is perhaps too encompassing a word. Uh, you can call it representative government, because quite frankly, if you cannot ground a society, ultimately, in the consent of the governed, you're going to collapse. It may take a while. It took uh, the Soviet Union from 1917 to 1991 to collapse, but it did. Uh, people worry about Iran today. Well, that's been going on for X number of years. But at some point, they're going to have to make a transition. And in fact, there is more openness in Iran uh, today than there was during most of the life of, uh, of, uh, of the Soviet Union. So, so these are basic ideas. And when people say the idea of the worth of the individual and of what we might, for an umbrella term, call democracy, that's the nature of the future in a globalized world, in a world where you can't cut off communication, no matter how hard you try, uh, that is a world that may be badly organized. And right now we are all hodgepodge in a lot of places, but, but that's the future. And mm -hmm. so I think the idea of Chinese authoritarianism, Chinese alternative model, or, or a Putin model, I mean, that is going to go once again into the ash heap of history. It may take a while, and we've got to do our part. And that, and I think, both Trump in his way and Biden in his way, I won't get into that, understand, you've got to be strong at home. We've got to get America right in all of these things. If we're because we had a lot of things buried, a lot of things buried. And co one thing COVID did is it brought to the fore how many left out people in America were the backbone of the American health and service sectors, health and service sectors. Uh, Black Lives Matter relates in part to American self-interest, and I hope we don't forget about it. So I'm I'm a great optimist. I, 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 it is, it is refreshing to see that much, uh, to see that much optimism in discussions of contemporary affairs, especially as we, the democracy is messy, uh, as we worry about whether, whether we're going to continue to pay our bills as a government and all that other fun stuff that keeps us, that keeps the headlines churning. But that yeah, debt doesn't matter. Don't worry about it. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm going to make a note of that one too. But the, uh, you raise a point, and I want to get the, the both of you, and also Oded Mayer asked this question about the Biden administration's attitude towards the Europeans. Um, that certainly the image that has come across lately is that Biden is not as fix is is not as fixated on the, on good relations with the Europeans. I would argue that neither Donald Trump nor Barack Obama was particularly good at working with the Europeans as much as the Europeans wanted to. But there is. There's a question about, as we, as we think about either within the transatlantic community, within the meta West, which broadens more outward, is how do we manage the, the, the sort of the ebb and flow of groups and groupings within it? So when the United States is, for example, right, one of the reasons why the French don't like AUKUS is because it looks an awful lot like les Anglo-Saxons are making decisions without France, which is exactly what bothered de Gaulle, which is why he thought that's why he said the British were not uh, European. But there's the, the issue of, uh, you know, how do different groupings work? How well are the Europeans demonstrating their commitment to the transatlantic relationship by being willing to spend enough on defense, by being willing to, to push for solidarity? Um, how well is the United States using its function as this dominant power that's both Atlantic and Pacific to bring both Pacific and Atlantic allies together? within this meta West? Are, uh, are we living up to our responsibilities? Um, if we are not, what can the leaders in this community do in order to uh, overcome short-term disagreements or overcome different uh, weaknesses? I'll go first to you, uh, Tiziana Stella. Yeah, um, Good question. Sorry. Uh, I think that Ambassador Hunter probably would have a better answer than mine. My is uh, more of a general comment. Sure. Um, and it goes back to also what we were discussing earlier on. Uh, democracy is built on divergence, internally it's built on divergences, and uh, we're able to bring that uh, to a consensus and to come to a consensus and to manage unity behind that consensus. So um, it seems that one problem that is difficult to solve, but it is important in the context of what you were asking now and in, in the context that we were discussing earlier on and uh, what Ambassador Hunter brought up, that well, uh, autocracies are more efficient. Yeah, mm -hmm. it is true, uh, but 
uh, one uh, one of the things that we should focus in in this regard is how do we manage these div divergences? Do we have structures that actually allow us to manage divergences or are our structures outdated in this new environment and we should um, maybe streamline the decision-making processes? How can we streamline these decision-making processes? Can we have coalitions of the willing that do not require a consensus before they uh, are put in place? And uh, are these divergences uh, big enough uh, to break uh, the solidarity that has been brought over the previous generations? So um, it seems to me that an overall comment on that is focus should be on coordinating action, but also on deepening the ability that uh, this Meta West has to deal with divergences to make it more resilient in moments in which there is big divergence on our uh, difficulties, but still making solid by having decision-making procedures that are agreed upon and can uh, be supported uh, despite disagreement. And that, mm -hmm. th that ties to the issue of, is democracy something that really stops at the borders or can we really translate democracy at a bigger level? And do we have um, a kind of responsibility to think about this issue in a world that is much more integrated and therefore, we need structures that are, are more flexible and that allow for divergence uh, while not creating crises that could be global threats, that could be existential risks, and uh, so on a much bigger scale. Great. Ambassador Hunter, what do you think about this, this issue of coordination? Well, first thing we have to understand is every country has its own interests. Mm -hmm. And just because you're an alliance doesn't mean you agree on anything. One of the miracles maybe it was because of the Soviet Union, probably was, is that the first 16 allies were able to work together. And one of the miracles, now that the Soviet Union is a, a pittance of the threat or challenge that it was before, is you now have 30 allies who more or less work together. Mm -hmm. That's a miracle, mm -hmm. uh, not the other way around. Uh, I do believe that in, when you get into security in military affairs, uh, you do need to keep the kinds of structures we have at NATO in which everything is decided by consensus in the following sense, that if you're going to ask a country uh, to put its young men and women's lives on the line, it has to be for something that they're willing to do. Now, they might do something, as I already indicated, by going to Afghanistan, because they want to make sure that when the chips are down, the United States will support them in Europe. Well, I think we took in too many countries and, and NATO has become unwieldy uh, and maybe the same as the European Union. Uh, but I would keep the consensus uh, principle. And incidentally, countries will uh, uh, follow the leader most of the thing. When Tiziana incidentally talks about coalitions of the willing, all coalitions are the willing. They've been doing the Cold War. Some would fight and some wouldn't. But uh, what NATO does is it may come up with a common agreement and then they put together who's going to actually do X and who's going to do Y. And one of the things, the great strengths of NATO, which we have to be very careful about, is once NATO 